Hey folks, welcome back to another review with yours truly, Sam Healy. Today we're taking a look at How Long The Way of the Dragon. It's a new game from Thunder Griff Games. And uh, it is basically an abstract strategy game where two dragons are battling for control over the same area. And whoever uh, is able to survive the uh, attacks, uh, the best is the winner. And a Moncala-esque movement around a center of the board called the Bagua is used to determine what kind of moves you'll be able to use on your turn. It is definitely just an abstract strategy game, but it has a really cool um, uh, Asian theme that's wrapped around it here, and I really like the look of it. Let's get down to the table. I'll show you how it works, and uh, then we'll come back for some final thoughts. So here I have set up for you a game of Tao Long, The Way of the Dragon. And basically it is an abstract strategy game where one player, the Heaven Dragon, is going to be going against the Earth Dragon. And uh, we're basically trying to vie for control of this area. And we're going to be fighting with each other, trying to damage each other uh, with ranged attacks or biting attacks to try to get them to lose their life points here, which are represented by these water uh, tiles, so to speak, or discs, uh, which represent our life. Uh, every time that our life uh, completely is gone, then one section of the dragon is going to be uh, done away with. And uh, after, uh, if that makes you lose your last uh, section, then you turn over and you are toast. You're dead. And the other player has won. Now, the way that you move your dragon around is by using the what they call the bagua over here. And there are um, mirrored movements on each of these different places. Heaven mirrors earth, wind mirrors thunder, water, mirrors fire, and mountain, mirrors lake. So the first two spaces that you can move to here are heaven and earth. Now, if the last disc you place is on heaven, uh, it's going to be your basic movement. If your dragon head is oriented in such a fashion as the white one is here right now, in a uh, column fashion, I guess you could say. And it simply means that you can move your dragon one or two spaces forward, depending on what you want in that particular instance. And then you take the last two segments over here and just fill in like so. And now you have moved your dragon using heaven. Now, uh, I talked about the, the orientation of your dragon. Heaven works if your dragon head is oriented this way. If your dragon head happens to be oriented this direction... Uh, it's going to be Earth that you'll need to activate in order to use that basic movement. And if you do, uh, like we said, it is one or two spaces. In this instance, it's only one space because we're running into an obstacle here. And then we'll flip it over like so. And that is completing the movement as well. Now, with wind and thunder, these two mirror each other uh, for the respective orientations of your uh, dragon head. Again, if you're using wind, which I would need to in this instance, I would be able to move the dragon head like this and then uh, finish its movement like so. And then I'll be able to do another activation. I have to do it, as a matter of fact. It's not something that you may or may not do. It is something that you must do. Uh, but this is also one of the keys to doing well in the game is utilizing wind and thunder to the best of your advantage so you can get a lot of those extra actions. Thunder does the same thing as wind. It's just that, again, it's the orientation of your dragon. So for example, right now, I would be able to use thunder to do something like this and then fill in uh, that segment like this right here. Uh, and then I would be able to take another move. Water and fire is where you're going to be able to uh, either uh, gather the elements of water and fire or expel the elements in an attack using this template right here, depending upon uh, where your dragon might be on the board. So if you finish your movement on fire, you can either simply take one fire token and place it into your reserve like so, 
or you can expel that element using this as an attack. And what that simply means is uh, something to this effect. Let's say that the dragon is like so, and we have done a fire attack, and we would simply take something to that effect, the token here, we would look where the dragon is overlapping. So it's one, that dragon will take one damage plus any damage for a number of tokens that you have using for the attack. So in this case, this dragon would take one, two, three points of damage. They would have to lose three of their life points back to the Bagua and then it would be uh, their turn. Now in water, it works pretty much the same way. As you can see, this token has a fire side and a uh, water side on both of them. So uh, you can use either or as an attack, but you can also use water as a healing action, uh, which simply means that you first of all uh, would uh, get a free move in any direction that you would like, and then you can take one water back from the Bagua like this, so it's healing. Now that is the uh, acquiring the element. If you expel it, it's used in much the same way as far as using the token is concerned, except that you're doing an amount of damage equal to whatever uh, number, the highest number that is overlapping the dragon, plus the number of water uh, uh, discs that are in the Bagua. So if I was able to make an attack right now, and let's just say that uh, I did so uh, like this, then it would be one, two, three points of damage for that dragon. And what would happen here is these two would be left, and then all four would come back because they automatically refill. He will have lost one of his tokens, his body segments. And then there's third, a third uh, damage left. He would have to lose that third one as well. And then finally, Lake and Mountain are the final two mirroring moves. And respecting the orientation of your dragon determines what you'll be able to do. Lake and Mountain are a don't move action depending upon your orientation. For example, uh, Mountain would be a no move action for the white dragon right now, the heaven dragon, uh, whereas Lake would be a no move for the earth dragon, the, the darker dragon down there. Also, uh, if you are in the Mountain, then the earth dragon will be able to either go forward one or turn either direction. And the lake action would be for the white dragon right now, go forward one or turn either direction. So uh, again, they mirror each other and depending upon the orientation of your dragon is telling you what you're able to do or what you can't do. Now you might be asking me, well, how, how are we moving on to this thing? And, and, and I understand that. I wanted to explain all of the different actions first because how you choose these different actions are very simple. It is basically a Moncala uh, action where you are taking the st uh, all of the discs from one space, dropping them, and wherever you drop your last disc, that's the action that you're going to choose to do. So for example, in this case, white would have been able to move this, but we probably wouldn't have done that because of the orientation of the dragon. However, whenever the uh, earth dragon goes, he will do something like this and land on wind, which again, wouldn't be good for him in this situation. But I just want to show you the uh, movement of the discs within the Bagua, which chooses uh, for you, which is, or rather, which is how you choose uh, what action you're going to take. So you will be restricted from time to time based upon the number of stones that are in each pile or discs rather. Uh, but you could, for example, take thunder and just move it to earth. And then that would be your case. Uh, that would be the action you take, or you could take heaven and go to fire. So it's really a Moncala-esque mechanism that's going on here. So it's probably uh, rather familiar to a lot of people. Other games use it as well. 
Now, another thing with movement and everything like that is concerned is are these portals that are here. And of course, um, obstacles, or maybe they're not obstacles that are placed on the board, uh, determined by a number of different kinds of uh, uh, scenarios that are within the rule book, as you can see here. So there's a lot of different uh, things in the rule book that allow you to change up the way the game is played, uh, the size of the surface, the board, um, uh, to restrict how much you can move and so forth and so on. So there's a lot of that kind of stuff in the rule book. But generally speaking, uh, these portals are used to move. For example, green portals can be moved in between. So for example, if I used a uh, action which drew me into the portal, um, I would actually come over here and choose any of the orthogonal um, uh, sides of this other green portal and move. Then this would turn like this. This would turn like this to show that the dr dragon is inside the portal and coming out the other side. All right, so when this is the case, this dragon can actually be attacked on this space, this space, this one, this one, and this one. So going through a portal uh, makes a greater number of possible attacking spaces for your opponent, but it does allow you to change your uh, position on the board in quite a dramatic way. Now, these two portals right here, in this specific scenario, which is just the basic one, there are no other uh, blue or red portals on the board. So, what you would be able to do is when you go into the red or the blue portal, you can come out any other open portal that is that is not being used currently. But in order to do that, you have to pay a, a, a fire element to do that or a water element in order to do that. So there is uh, the portal movement around the board. There are other kinds of tiles in the game uh, that can be used for a number of different things. For example, there are obstacles that can be broken through. Uh, there are other colored portals like so, and uh, as I showed you earlier, all of these different things use all of these tiles in different ways, and the scenario is, is very good about explaining how they're supposed to be used. So that is Tao Long. Now, I've showed you just basically what they call the grasshopper version of the game. Just the bare bones, basic way that you can play the game uh, with all of the different scenarios that are in the book. There are also two other levels of, uh, I guess you could call them variants, but they're they're not really. They're, they're almost just different levels of play because when you add another level, for example, the monk level, uh, the uh, configuration of the uh, stones, either the white or the black stones in the Bagua, determine whether or not two different effects, a focus effect and a balance effect, are going to take place. Now, there is also the master uh, way of playing the game, which includes the monk and the grasshopper uh, modes of play. And this one simply means that uh, if you look on the spaces, whatever stack of discs or stones that you take to uh, then start placing to choose your movement. The number of uh, colored stones within that stack determine which way, either clockwise or counterclockwise, that you're able to move that that stack of stones. And then, of course, there's a, I think this is a joke, but there's also the chosen one, where you only move things around the board, uh, about around the bagua. You move the stones around the bagua. All of the movement of your dragons is done inside your head. If the grasshopper version that I showed you seems too simple, then I wouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak, because there are different levels of complexity, which I think greatly uh, raises the difficulty level of the game as far as everything you have to keep track of, and it, and it makes it a pretty thinky abstract game if you add in those other variants. Now, what about some pros and cons? Well, uh, let's go with the uh, low-hanging fruit first. The first pro is uh, the 
the look of the game, uh, the art style, the graphic design, the different um, uh, components that were used throughout the game. While they were very basic and simple, I thought they were very also thematic and almost period-esque, uh, meaning that if you had this ancient Asian-themed game uh, with a bunch of really flashy components in it, it would look kind of strange uh, because the pieces don't match the period. The con of, well, one of the cons that I'm going to uh, mention to you is, um, quite frankly, again, it's is uh, um, a mistake that a lot of different kinds of publishers are making. Um, and again, I, I don't really think that it's a huge mistake, but as you can see, this box does, is not, this size of box is not necessary except for the size of the board. And I'm pretty sure the size of the board, this is a trifold, as you can see here. Uh, they probably could have made this a, a, a quarter fold, I guess you would call it, where it would, uh, you know, fold. Um, uh, on itself this way and then again on this self so it would be a square rather than a rectangle. I think that could have been possibly done but uh, with all that having been said the, the only reason that the box is this big is because the board. Um, the rest of the components for the game are, are quite simply this and I can hold it in one hand it's not necessary for this box. So I think the box is slightly deceptive. Uh, another pro is that I think the rule book was very well written and uh, it has a lot of really cool things in it. Um, cheat sheets on the back, uh, very easy setup rules. Uh, the different scenarios are all very clearly laid out so the rule book is very well written. Uh, another um, pro of the game for me is the fact that it is simple to play. Uh, I don't like abstract games that, that feel like brain burners to me, and those are the ones that I stay away from. If an abstract game is very simple to teach, looks good, and uh, then offers also a, a deep uh, kind of uh, thought process, not hard, not difficult, but there are some you know balls that you have to keep on, up in the air, so to speak, uh, and in and, and making good moves, being able to uh, choose quickly, which is the best move on that Bagua. These are all things that I look forward to in a in an abstract strategy game. So I mean, all in all, uh, I'm gonna give this game uh, two thumbs up. I really enjoy it. It is a very good. Uh, abstract strategy game as far as a number out of 10, I'm probably going to rest around a 7 out of 10. Um, abstract strategy games are, are not really my forte, although there were a lot that came out this year that I really did enjoy. Um, so I, I, that's the highest I think that I can give uh, an abstract strategy gain around the seven, seven and a half area. Uh, but that's just me. If I, if I call it a seven, seven and a half, uh, somebody who really enjoys abstract strategy games may not like it, but they may like it more. Uh, just depends on their personal point of view, I guess. So uh, I, I really do enjoy this. I think they did a great job with the uh, design. The only real drawback is the size of the box, I think is slightly deceptive, but uh, the way they decided to make the board, it was kind of necessary. So I understand that, but I just... <sighs> box size is... I don't like it when it, the game looks bigger than it actually is. But that having been said, I think they did a great job with uh, all of the other aspects of design as far as the, the rule book and the graphic design and making a game that is fun to play. And it's also challenging as well. Uh, these are all pluses in my book. So a great game. You need to go check it out. Always, as I say, try before you buy. But uh, that is Tao Long, The Way of Dragon from Thundergriff Games. We'll see you guys on the flip side. Thank you.